Listen, all I can say is that when you have like artistic freedom to take your own liberties with a show that's based on a true story and the true story is creepier and better done than your show, we have a serious problem. That's it. That's my intro. Hi, I'm Amanda. You're watching Small Entertainment. And today I am coming to you from my crappy hotel room uh, here in the Sahara. No offense to the Sahara, but this hotel room may be the worst laid out hotel room I have ever stayed in. It's very odd. Uh, but I'm here for When We Were Young Fest, and it's currently day one, and it was canceled due to extreme wind advisory. Uh, but since I'm here still, I am obviously going to have to continue to make content while I'm here, which is why you guys have my run and gun travel setup because my usual setup is just far too heavy for traveling with. So you guys got this microphone, which I do have to keep this close to my mouth. Otherwise, it barely picks up any audio. So I guess I'm just auditioning for a hosting job the entire time we're filming today. But today we are talking about The Watcher on Netflix. And I wasn't going to do a video on it. I didn't plan to. However, I started watching the first episode, made it about 15, 20 minutes in before I had to rage quit and started yelling about it on Instagram. That was my first mistake because then everyone was like, you know, we now need you to make a video on it. That's how this works. You tell us something and we demand a video. My own fault. I should have expected that. I then had to force myself to watch the rest of the show. Even as someone who like has been dealing with a lot of issues with like my attention span lately, because uh, TikTok is giving me manufactured ADHD. I've never like used like the speed settings on Netflix until this show. So I did start watching it at like 1.5, 2.0 speed. I did have a problem with the fact that I then could still understand them better and it felt like they were having actual conversations and not announcing things weirdly. The Watcher is based on a real unsolved mystery. And this article I'll have linked down below, this is from The Cut. This is originally how I found out about The Watcher and the family, the Broadduses, uh, that were affected by The Watcher. There is a very popular episode of BuzzFeed Unsolved um, for their mysteries episode or something talking about The Watcher. And people also said that was a better watch viewing experience than the show. For the most part, no one I have spoken to myself likes the show. I have some people on Twitter and the like talk about like how they like the show, but everyone seems to unanimously hate the ending, which I agree with. And I can't possibly go through this show in the way that I normally do because it's just far too much and so convoluted and so stupid. They decided to go out of their way. Okay, hang on. I'm getting ahead of myself. The cut article is written by Reeves Weedman and the tagline is The Watcher. A family bought their dream house, but according to the creepy letters they started to get, they weren't the only ones interested in it. The article starts by saying that Derek Broaddus had just finished an evening of painting at his new home in Westfield, New Jersey. When he went outside to check the mail, Derek and his wife Maria had closed on a six bedroom house at 657 Boulevard three days earlier and were doing some renovations before they moved in. So there wasn't much in the mail except for a few bills and a white card-shaped envelope. It was addressed in thick, clunky handwriting to the new owner, and the type note inside began warmly. Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. It's my understanding, and the article talks about this, that while the story was still kind of unfolding and the Broadduses were still dealing with everything, that one show actually came out. Broadduses were like, uh, we're going to sue you, and then didn't, I think. And they turned down a bunch of people uh, who tried to buy the story from them because it's a creepy story. You think about it. Family with young children move into a new house in what is considered the one of the safest cities in the country, let alone New Jersey, and start getting creepy letters talking about their house, talking about what's in the walls, talking about young blood and how they're going to call to the children. It's a scary story and it's really unsettling. I get why Hollywood was like, give it to me give it to me now. I get it. They turned it down and then they apparently sold the story to Netflix. This is a BuzzFeed article from uh, Nora Dominic. The real The Watcher family reportedly sold their story to Netflix for a lot of money and requested two changes be made. For the most part, from what I understand, like family starts getting letters after buying a new house. Done. Ending. That's it. That's the only conclusion. That and then the ending, which is part of the problem, is they left it unsolved. And that's what a lot of people hate because they kind of left a lot of things open-ended and they, they, some people were like they were trying to set it up for a sequel and all this stuff. I don't care. 
I don't care. I once saw someone say that we deserve complete stories talking about specifically Marvel movies and the Marvel shows that were coming out. And like, no, I shouldn't have to watch something and then kind of be blue balled with an ending because, oh, it's going to be answered in the movie. That's not something like we are owed complete stories, basically. I agree with that sentiment. I think that, you know, any Marvel movie for the most part, aside from like the big like Avengers team up movies, other than those, I think the other movies should be able to stand on their own in my opinion. And I think a lot of the early MCU movies do. I don't think a lot of the new ones do. The show is proving to be a big winner for Netflix. Is it though? In 2018, Netflix won a contentious bidding war for the rights to The Watcher. And at the time, it was slated to be a film. According to Deadline, Netflix seemingly paid seven figures for the rights package, which included the original cut article and the rights of the beleaguered homeowners who've lived this nightmare for four years. At the time, a number of notable film and TV producers wanted to acquire the rights. With one horror producer reportedly offering to buy the house at 657 Boulevard in hopes of using it as a set, according to the cut. Dude, that's brilliant. I also would have gone that route. Like, let's just buy the house. Maybe we'll start getting threats while filming. Like, that that, that would absolutely be the hope. By selling the rights to their story to Netflix, the broadest has got some control when it came to the creation of the series, which is when they requested that two changes be made when it was adapted for TV. According to the cut, the first request the family made it for the show, or at the time, the movie, not use their real names, which is why Naomi Watts and Bobby... Cannavales. Characters are named Nora and Dean Brannick instead of Maria and Derek Broaddus. The next request also involved their family's depiction on screen. They asked the producers to make sure the family in the series look as little as theirs in real life as possible. In the show, Nora and Dee have two kids, whereas in real life, the Broaddus family has three children. So the original children involved in the Watcher situation were five, eight, and ten. In the show, they only have two children and they're about 12 and then 15. And the only reason I could really justify it other than uh, Ryan Murphy's creepy I said it, I meant it. I get changing the kids. I get having two and kind of making the family look different. However, having the 16-year-old daughter, I was immediately uncomfortable when she was there. No offense to the actress. And I'm not going to critique the acting of the show because my main gripes are with the writing and the directing. Most of these people I've seen act in other things. And I know you can act. You don't have to prove it to me. This show is not an example of that, in my opinion. The daughter is about 16. And immediately when you have the older daughter, and then I think Ryan Murphy, and I think you guys are going to put her in a situation. You're going to make things weird. And sure enough, she immediately starts kind of flirting and having the older security guard who's 19 at the time. She's 15 and then 16. They're flirting. They start making out. And uh, what ends up happening with the daughter is that they kind of start dating in secret the nosy neighbors tell the dad watch what's going on in your house your daughter's sorry it's not the neighbors it's the guy it's like i mean i would be concerned if i saw my daughter talking with the boy like that like that type of thing and so he asks his daughter daughter lies obviously parents concoct this plan to get her to leave her phone in her room, no phones at the table now, new rule. The dad thinks his daughter is lying about being in a relationship with an older guy. And so he knows her password, but then he doesn't go to the messages to see what they're talking about, to see if there is in fact evidence of relationship. No, he starts going through her photos. And sure enough, there is a photo of her in her underwear that she took in an earlier episode and a different photo she took. It, like uh, she didn't take the uh, the underwear photo and her face isn't in it, by the way. But she did take like kind of like a little saucy photo and like a little nightgown teddy top thingy in an, an earlier part of the episode. Swipes through and there's the security guard's shirtless torso as well. And he shows her the photo and like is showing the photo of her in the underwear. Like, you you lied to me? You lied to me? He starts screaming at her. Ryan Murphy. Can you hear me? B F F R. Be fucking for real. I'm serious. Like, are you joking? You you think your daughter's in a secret relationship, so you go through her photos first? No. You go through her call logs. You go through her text messages. That's what you do. That's what his wife ends up doing in a different episode when she thinks he's cheating. And so it's like, oh God, I just I hate it. And that's the only reason I was like, yeah, this is this is why they aged her up. I'm cutting myself off here because I need to talk about other things. But my point with bringing up the daughter's age and all of the stuff is that I think there was another way you could do this where you could still follow the Broaddus's request of making the family look different without kind of going the route of like, okay, older teenage daughter, just so you can have a daughter and put her in underwear. You know, that's that's the only reason I can think of why you did this. Like, that's the only thing I can think of. There were so many other storylines you could have done with the children and having them be younger. I You can still have them be younger without having them be in the same age group as the broadest children. Part of my complaint with changing the ages of the children so drastically and also barely utilizing the son, they utilize the son pretty much in episode one 
And that's really it. There's so much bullshit <laughs> with this show. There's so much in circles, so much I hate because there's so much that I like. It sounds so bad because this was a real family dealing with this, but there's so much in the true story that is terrifying and very unsettling. And it seems like that wasn't good enough. And I get if there's changes you want to make for the show for legal reasons, even though the family sold it to you and asked for these two changes. There's so much that they could have kept. They changed the original letters slightly. So in the original letter, I've been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s and my father watched in the 1960s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. In the show, they changed it so that someone watched it in the 1920s, someone else watched it in the 1960s, and now it's my turn. Which I thought was telling that they were kind of trying to get rid of the implication of like gender implications. And certain things they did keep as well, like finding female DNA on the envelopes. That was also part of the true story. You know, someone playing a video game or involving a video game where they're playing a character of the watcher or their screen name is the watcher, like in the show. There's things that are kept, but they're not even kept well, in my opinion. They're like, thrown in there almost like an easter egg I, I don't even know where to fuck where do i start um oh yeah the terrible writing of all of the characters <laughs> i always hate when i do this this is something that my acting teacher likes to say uh is the nature of talk so like if someone's doing a scene and they're yelling or they're being like crazy or over enunciating certain words or enunciating random words she stops us and says that's not how people talk that's not the nature of talk just talk normally you know the lines i think the same thing can be applied to writing in a lot of situations there's the nature of talk and that's where i think a lot of writers and people struggle with writing dialogue because you feel like okay i need them to say this for the story but then it doesn't make sense of why a human being with life experience and a personality would say these words in this way you know the same goes with every single character in this town. I tweeted out that everyone on the show was either a moron or the plot twist was going to be that there was something in the water supply because everyone in this show has one setting and it's suspicious as hell. That is their one setting. My guess is they did that to try and make it seem like everyone is a suspect. It could be anyone. It could be any of your neighbors. It could be the detective. It could be the private eye. It could be your childhood friend who became a real estate agent and is fabulous, but also kind of a bitch. In the show, Dean, the father, Nora, in a sense, also, they go straight to anger and there isn't a lot of fear. It's seems like the fear is the secondary emotion. He's immediately pissed. Like immediately. He's immediately angry. He's also just rude to like all the neighbors. So like, yeah, anyone that you would maybe want to help you in this situation, he's already alienated them. But they also alienated him because they're Again, suspicious as hell from the moment that they're even looking at buying the house. They haven't even put an offer in yet. And everyone's already like, I hate you type of thing. It's so stupid. It just doesn't work. If they had gone with the route of, yes, this family was targeted from before they even moved or thought about moving to Westfield, then it would make sense. But they didn't do that. Like at all. They were like, no, we just hate you because of X. What is that? Oh, it's trash. For whatever reason, we just don't like you. You know, there's no per there's no other reason I can think of. And they, it, they again, this could have worked with the children. Like, oh, yeah, we hate children. We hate that you have children because pretty much no one else in the neighborhood or in the cast of the show has children that are young children. They're all grown if they have children at all. And so I think that that could have been a motivation like, oh, we don't want a rowdy family moving into this house. And so they're angry and suspicious because of the children right away. And there are certain comments that are made like the couple that sits on their lawn chairs watching them from their lawn. They complain about the music being played that the daughter is playing on the piano. Dean is like, we can't get her to play that piano. But like she asked when the piano was coming. So I don't get why they also had him say there's a lot of contradictory things that are said by the characters versus what's the reality versus what's being done. In particular, a line that I personally couldn't stand um, was uh, when he's buying the house or he's trying to get the money for buying the house because also, I hate that in episode one, they already make it very clear that Dean is making a substantially stupid not even risky, like detrimental. You know it's a detrimental decision financially with buying the house. And they make that very clear in episode one. They make it a 
personal choice, a, a conscious effort to show and demonstrate that he knows that this is a terrible idea. And I just, I, I hate that because that's a reveal. It's my understanding that in the actual story, the family actually never moved into the house. I believe Derek stayed there because of painting and things like that, but they never moved the kids in because they were worried about the letters. The letters unsettled them immediately. They stayed at their old house and then they stayed at Maria's parents' house and the like. They just never actually moved in and that was part of the issue with selling the house. They got rid of that issue by just having the family move in immediately in the show. Now, in doing that, I do think that that works better, especially with what you want to do. But then what you could have done is be like, why are they staying here? Start looking for another house. Move out. Why aren't they leaving? Why aren't they leaving? Nora going to Dean and being like, why aren't we leaving? And then that's when it's revealed how much he's in the hole and what he's done. And they did that a little bit, but it's so much less of a punch, I feel. It lands so flat because they have the Adora, who was the private investigator, tell Nora after Nora believes that uh, he is cheating uh, on her Dean and kicks him out she goes to uh, Theodora and is like what do you know like tell me I just need to know what's going on do you think that Dean is the watcher because now I think that Dean is the watcher she then explains to Nora just how financially in the hole they are and what Dean did because basically Dean has her sign away their retirement in order to get the house and then goes back to the bank because they then start doing all of these renovations, which the house did not need renovations. They needed to paint those ugly ass cabinets that they had in the house, which I'm glad they ended up changing those because they were hideous. They were like black with like gold flex painted on. It was so stupid. I hated it. I was like, whoever had this house before you had terrible taste is the reality. My point is, is that they could have still had that reveal with Theodora and Nora. And I felt like it would have landed better with the audience if we didn't know that Dean had already made a conscious decision to basically financially ruin himself and his wife by buying the house. And there is dramatic irony when the audience knows something that the characters don't. But in this case, they used it so much for the show that it was just, and it was just done so poorly that it just, again, makes me think that every single character is an idiot because they sometimes are like, okay, we're letting the audience know something. But then... I know that, okay, immediately you're going to show me something else because that's how your plot devices work because you, you can't let it go two episodes. You have to tell me it immediately. I brought up the subject complaint about the lines. Dean tells the bank guy, I want a yard for my children to play in. I want them to grow up somewhere else. Their kids are 12 and, you know, six, 15, 16. They, I, don't, I don't even think they go outside and like spend time in the yard even with or without the watcher. Like when they think the watcher is gone, essentially the kids don't go outside. It's like there's lines that were written before they were told they couldn't have the kids ages or something like that, which that doesn't even, it's not even the question. You could still have two children, maybe have twin daughters or like something drastically different than three children, but are still young children. Because in my opinion, the whole young blood, like, the watcher saying like, did you bring the house young blood 657 Boulevard young blood? Once I learn their names, I'm going to call to them. That's terrifying older children teenagers are already very suspicious of adults and forget just stranger danger a lot of teenagers are just like suspicious in general okay and so they're not gonna go and talk to a stranger that's staying at the edge of their property calling their name for the most part younger children would and that's the concern. That's the scary part is that you can be as safe as you possibly can with your child, but your child is still a child. There are still things that they don't understand. They don't really understand the danger of situations yet. They don't know certain things and how things are going to play out. And so that's why I think that they should have kept a younger age for the children, because I think that it makes the young blood comments creepier. An entire point of the letters is the young blood talking about the young blood and how 657 needs young blood. I brought it young blood. I brought it you. I asked the previous owners to sell their house because they, you know, didn't have young blood. You have young blood. Are there more on the way? Are you planning for more? They need young blood. You know what you could have done here is have Nora. I know it's like they're an older couple at this point, but like they could still get pregnant. You have a pregnancy scare or have her choose, have her have an older pregnancy, you know, or whatever. That's sounds so bad. Someone's gonna be like, there's older moms. That's not my point. You could have the 16 and 12 year old if you really wanted to, but then have her, you know, surprise, I'm pregnant. But like, you know, we have all this room. We have this beautiful house. Let's keep the baby. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm here. I can still do art. You know, you could have done that whole thing. And then you get start getting the letters or the letters start mentioning the baby, start making guesses about like, I think it's going to be a boy. And then she goes and sure enough, it's a boy, you know, like things like that would be terrifying. Okay. And then 
that way you don't just abandon the young blood storyline because it doesn't even seem like they're all that concerned about their children. They kind of made it seem like they were harassing Nora and Dean more than anything. My allergies are acting up, so my voice sounds crazy. But the way they kind of brought back in the young blood storyline, in a sense, is that they made it so that the neighbors may or may not have been in a blood cult. Former owner, not the ones that they bought the house from, but the former, former owner. He had a son who uh, apparently he saw uh, one of the neighbors like sucking his blood or something. And it led to a whole stream of random stuff that eventually again got abandoned which is why i hate this show in the original story the fbi did get involved with the letters and basically pointed out that though the letters sound almost educated the misspellings and uh, the erratic nature of the notes themselves essentially indicated an erratic personality and how that could lead to someone being willing to commit harm, even though there was no like swear words, despite the anger in the letters. Like there's the article goes into the whole thing, the whole breakdown of it all. And I guess that just goes back to my point talking about everyone being suspicious and no one acting how they should be, because in the original story, the uh, Rodices were told by the police investigators to not tell anyone one about the letters because it could be one of your neighbors you know everyone that lives here wants better property and it's a very cutthroat game to buy houses here so yeah you could have beat out one of your neighbors for this house and that's why they could be sending you these letters and so they were told not to tell anyone and so dean going out of his way to like i know it's you sending those letters to literally anyone who's in front of him it seems like at any given point is so stupid to me especially because even when there's any form of pushback i feel like even even new yorkers like even people from new york especially when he knows that this is like his family's dream home and he's trying to like yeah we're trying to live in a better city i wanted to get out of the new york i wanted to live in a safer environment for my kids and all this stuff why would you not try to make nice with your neighbors why would you immediately attack them and get verbally aggressive once they poke at you even slightly there's this whole shtick with the dumb waiter neighbors across the way pearl and jasper winslow their siblings jasper it, we are told is a mute however he does speak it's just like when he feels like it and usually not around strangers which means not around dean and nora and the rest of the family but they live across the way and they are apparently the entirety of the historical decision society and they are obsessed specifically jasper is obsessed with the dumb waiter in the house because the house is like a hundred years old and the dumb waiter is a national treasure and pearl keeps telling us that there was this really funny moment in the first episode that i did think was very funny where the son carter is like I'm going to show my ferret the the dumbwaiter. He's going to ride in the dumbwaiter. And so he calls the dumbwaiter up to him. And then sure enough, he opens it. And Jasper is sitting inside the dumbwaiter and goes, boo. And it's so funny because the kid just starts screaming. And then Dean yanks him out and like throws him out. And then Pearl runs inside. What are you doing? The other owners used to love to let uh, Jasper come in. Jasper has been riding that dumbwaiter for years. The other family was cool with it. And then he's like, well, it's not us. Do not come on my property again, or I'm calling the police on you. Pearl's very aggressive. She's very much like, talk to me, I talk back. That that song, <laughs> that's Pearl. She wears pigtails everywhere, which they try to make it seem like she's the pigtail person because, okay, Dakota is the security kid, the one that's dating daughter. And what ends up happening is that once they take her phone and her tablet for dating him and all the stuff. It's like, I don't care if it's legal. You're not allowed to date him. You're not allowed to date. She goes and gets her brother's iPad and makes a TikTok saying she's not allowed to be with the man she loves because he's black. Basically saying that her father is a racist and puts it on TikTok. And this becomes like almost a non-issue. Like an episode later, they did it terror. They they executed the whole show is bad. But there was so many other options you could have gone here that would have made sense because that's not even what almost gets him fired. What almost gets him fired is that everyone goes to Nora and is like, "You can escape this. You can kick him out. You can divorce him. You can he he's done. He's done. You know, racism never looks good. True. He's like, you know, I'm not racist to his daughter, and she's like, I know. I don't care. And it's like, okay. I get you want to be with your boyfriend, but also this doesn't look good on you either. You know, like it's just, it, 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 it's not. And then it's like, he just lets it slide and it becomes a non-issue for all of them. Aside from the fact that like Nora gets booted from the country club, her membership is suspended. 
because she's married to what the world believes is a racist. And TikTok was never even mentioned before that. Like, it's not explained like, oh, she's a TikTok star. She starts it with, hi, guys. I know I haven't been on here in a while. Like, she's a YouTuber who got canceled and then came back like she took a break. Seems like no one knows how things work. Okay, let's talk about pigtails. And uh, <laughs> like I said, everyone is suspicious all the time, always. Um, and we have Karen. Her name is Karen, played by the wonderful Jennifer Coolidge. She's the real estate agent who is also Nora's childhood friend. And uh, she is suspicious always, but she's very clearly trying to get Nora to sell the house immediately. They just bought the house from her and she's immediately trying to get her to sell it because she thinks that they can get a cheaper price for it. It's, it's, it's a real estate scheme. That's all it is. That's what it is. That's That's her whole motivation. And it's very clear based on the ending that it wasn't Karen. That was the watcher, or at least that she wasn't the only watcher, that she wasn't the main one because of what ends up happening. And Nora, again, is everyone's either an idiot or there's something in the water because she doesn't get that Nora does not have her best interest in heart and is very clearly trying to get the house out from her. She ends up buying the house when they do end up selling it, which, you know, <gasps> the dad tells the daughter and Dakota that they can't see each other anymore and accuses Dakota of being the watcher. Dakota voluntarily goes to the police department to give a statement, be questioned, give DNA to kind of clear himself. And so he went in, he goes in with his mother and an attorney. And then he's so upset about Dean doing that to him that he takes video footage that he got from the camera he set up in their bedroom. That was just considered a non-issue immediately from everyone involved, which I thought was suspicious. Where there's a, what looks like a fairly young girl in pigtails. You never really see her face. She's wearing a nightgown. She kind of takes off her nightgown, lays down in bed with Dean. Dean is asleep. He never wakes up. She like strokes his face. He, she then goes and watches him and then like leave. Well, we never actually see her leave, but she supposedly leaves. And he takes that video and sends it to his boss. And then I think he's also the one that sent it to Nora because the the watch me typeface on the front is the same. It's cut out of newspapers and magazines. So I think it was also Dakota that sent it to his wife. So the racism isn't why he's maybe going to get fired. It's the fact that he is pr seemingly asleep while a young girl broke into his house because they think that he's automatically cheating on Nora, even though he's clearly asleep in the video. He never wakes up. And the fact that no one said, huh, this is from security footage on our feed. We should check the surrounding security footage. What day was this? When was this? Why the fuck is there a camera in our room? Hey, we should sue him for unlawful surveillance. That's never a topic, but I guess, hey, they already did threaten him. So I guess it doesn't matter. He already had to go and clear his name for this. So I guess they could have probably, no one would have listened to them. But still, there's, there is a video camera in there. To give a little bit of context, if we can even call it that, the guy who said, you should look at who your daughter is talking to, introduced himself as John. And then Theodora tells Dean about this guy named John Graff who lived in the house and then murdered his entire family, erased his identity from all the family photos, and then fled and has never been found. Try and speculate that maybe this guy that came in and was like talking about his daughter and talking about uh, Dean's daughter was actually John Graff. Now, this guy is actually based off of John List, who was a guy who did, in fact, murder his whole family in Westfield, New Jersey. Basically, Pigtails is dressed like the daughter, John Graff's daughter in the show, in the crime scene photos of the bodies found. Never really got a concrete answer, but the expectation, because we never see her come or go, is that either this is someone who broke into the house dressed as the daughter, or this is a ghost living in the house. There is a whole secret tunnel system. Barely do anything with it, but basically there's a secret way in and out of the house connected to what appears to be Pearl and Jasper's house and John, the guy who's pretending to be John Graff, but I think his name is actually Martin, but then we actually get uh, some confirmation later that it may or may not actually be John Graff. I don't know. Um, he is going back and forth through the house using the tunnel system. But Nora is immediately like, how dare you cheat on me, all this stuff, even though, again, you don't see the girl's face. He's clearly asleep and no one's like, we should watch the rest of the footage or we should look at the other cameras sure enough later dakota does do that he's like you're right i'm sorry i set up the camera in there because i thought you were the watcher i thought i could catch you watch writing a note or leaving and sure enough we find out that dean did in fact write the third note which we found out from theodora because the way that he writes uh to mm Brannock on the f the front of the letter 
uh, he does the K in the same way that Dean does his Ks. And so Theodora figures that out and tells Nora. And so Nora's like, you're the watcher. You want me to leave? And he admits he's like, yeah, I did it because I, I we needed to sell the house and I knew you wouldn't leave unless there was one more letter. I needed to scare you just a little bit more so that we could leave. But I did not write the first two letters. The first two letters were real. And it seems like almost, again, it's handled poorly. It's done so quickly. It's not even like a a bombshell. The way the original Watcher story got out is to my understanding they tried to file a complaint against the family that sold them the house originally because they in fact did receive a letter but it was just odd versus scary so the family did not, they threw out the letter and did not alert the Protases that they got a letter and then sold the house and so they tried to file a complaint basically saying that they should have disclosed it to us and therefore like trying to get out of the sale essentially and so in doing that in the complaint they had to include the letters that they had received at that point and so it a local journalist found the letters and were like, ooh, news, you know? Like, so that's how all this came to light originally. In trying to sell the house, they uh, were like, okay, well, what if we sell two separate lots to a developer and get a million for the developer and we'll tear down the house? And they went to like a town, there was like a town hall meeting about it and people said no because the house is more important basically than their family. A lot of people believe that the Broadduses were making it up uh, to try and, you know, get out of the sale that they bit off more they can, than they could chew, which would have fit here. I don't get why they didn't go that route. It ended up being overruled. They did, they did not approve the selling of the house and breaking it into two lots and tearing down the house that way. Last Christmas Eve, several families received an envelope in their mailboxes. They'd been delivered by hand to the homes of people who had been most vocal in criticizing the Broadduses online. One of them, who lived a few blocks down on Boulevard, had written on Facebook, I wish we could go back to the days of tar and feathers. I have just the couple in mind. Another family who got the letter told me it was weirdly poetic, as the Watchers had been, and that it accused the families of speculating inaccurately about the Broadduses, and included several stories about recent acts of domestic terrorism in which signs of brewing mental illness had gone unnoticed. The type letters were signed, Friends of the Broaddus Family. The letter writer had clearly been infected not only with the Watchers' penchant for anonymous notes, but also simmering resentment, one that had snaked its way through Westfield, making enemies of neighbors. The people who received the letters did didn't know who sent them, but the tone had a familiar ring to me. When I asked Derek Broaddus whether he had written them, he paused for a moment, then admitted he had. He wasn't proud of it. He hadn't even told his wife and said they were the only anonymous letters he'd written. But he had felt driven to his wit's end, fed up with watching silently as people threw accusations at his family based on practically nothing. One of the people who received the letter told me they had never met the Broadduses and had no interest in doing so. The Watcher had been obsessed with 657 Boulevard, and Derek, in turn, had become obsessed with the Watcher and everything the letters had set in motion. It's like cancer, he told me. We think about it every day. Derek handed me his phone so I could read the fourth letter. You are despised by the house, it read, and the Watcher won. Again, this this is better than what ends up happening because what ends up happening in the show, again, they do end up leaving the house. Essentially, they can't sell it, but they just keep it. They try to get an offer. They can't leave. They get an apartment in New York. Dean is still obsessed with the story. Nora is living her best life. She's doing art shows, trying to go back to normal. The kids are trying to go back to normal. And Dean is just obsessed with the watcher. He sent letters to everyone, basically threatening the neighbors because, again, he still thinks that it was the neighbors. And then what ends up happening, the final episode, the one, the ending that everyone is so pissed off about is that Theodora, who is has been dying of cancer since we've been introduced to her. She basically confesses that she's the watcher. She tells Dean that like, here's how I did everything. Here's why I did everything. Basically says that she lived in the house, got her cancer diagnosis, had to sell the house. And uh, then, you know, she did have enough money that uh, her husband left behind. And so she could, in fact, buy the house. But you had already moved in there. So I just wanted you to leave so that I could have the house back before I died from cancer. And then we find out from one of the neighbors, the creepy watching neighbors that watched them, that no, no one named Theodora lived there. Like it was this couple that lived there before you. And then they go to Theodora's funeral and her daughter is like, yeah, no, I, I caught her taking notes and planning out a story. She basically said that she wanted to give you closure because she knew that Dean would never stop hunting for the watcher until he had an answer. And so Theodora decided this is what I can do. I can give them the boogeyman so that they can kind of move on with their lives. People were pissed about that because then the show ends with no resolution, basically. They sell the house to a family with young children. Yikes. Dean is like sitting in front of the house watching, talks to the neighbors, seemingly leaves a note for them, or at least like leaves a note in the mailbox, watches him get a note from his mailbox, basically implying that he is now the watcher. And then Nora calls, says, hey, I'm glad you're, I'm, I think things are going good. I'm glad you're working on this. And then he pulls away and then Nora pulls up because she was watching him. And then it ends. And it ends with it saying, 
the watcher case is still unsolved <clears throat> can you hear me fuck you okay how dare you how dare you try and make it sound like a bookend like yes this is based on a true story it's still an unsolved case you could have i hate it the way i would have phrased fixed this entire thing is just kind of make it seem like this is a setup for what ends up actually happening in the unsolved case, basically. Forget the broadest, forget trying to make it seem like the story. Make it so that these are the previous owners to the broadest buying the house. We know who it is. It's the Woodses, the Woods or something are the ones who buy it, but like kind of set it up like maybe do full based on a true story or inspired by true events or however you can say it without getting sued. And then kind of set it up like this is what happens before the broadest the the Brannocks move in that way you can kind of have like oh yeah no the previous owner yeah he did have to sell the house because this was all happening and he's decided no one gets to live in this house properly you know that's the only way I can really think this worked but obviously they didn't do it that way and I just I, I hate the show I don't like it the original article the BuzzFeed Unsolved episode is probably better than the entire show no one I know that's actually watched the show liked it none of them uh so I don't know why BuzzFeed is saying that this is like a win for Netflix, I wholeheartedly disagree. That's really gonna be it. I know this was long-winded and all over the place, and I'm sorry for any audio issues or any video issues. Sorry, I'm traveling. You know how it is. Anyways, <laughs> that's gonna be it. Did you watch The Watcher? Are you familiar with The Watcher case? Did you watch the BuzzFeed Unsolved episode talking about The Watcher? How would you overall fix the story? Do you hate how I did this video? Let me know, comment down below. Reminder, I have a podcast, The Swell Shane's Podcast. New episodes, eventually. Reminder, I have merch. I have nothing to point to. Shout out to my Patreon. Thank you so much for supporting me on Patreon. If you'd also support me on Patreon, let me listen down below. If you'd like to follow me on all my social media, that'll be all up here. And that's going to be it. Have a lovely day. Goodbye. I just can't get over. You think your daughter has a secret boyfriend. So you go through her photo album. Did you think she was screenshotting the messages? Like, I don't even get what the logic behind that was. Thank you, Alan, Cameron, Christopher, Chris, Chris P, Crash PC, China, Dirty One, Don, Elliot, Evan, Eric, Y'all, Hopeless, Incognito, Jack Array, James, Joe, John, M, Jordan, Joseph, Kenny, Kim, Kristen, Lamb, Lexi, Louise, Matt, Matt, O, Matthew, S, Meme Lord, Michael, Michael, J, Micah, Nathan, Nathaniel, Pat, Penn, Richard, Rob, Red, Robert Ross, Sam, Serena, Skylar, Simon, Chocolate, Timothy, Heavenly, Plastic, Tom, Quirty, Randy, Wendy, Williams under his wink.